Okay, let's have a look at the sixth topic of introduction to algebra. In this topic, we'll talk about proportion. Okay, first, let's have a look at the concept of direct proportion. When the ratio of two variable quantities is always the same, we say the two quantities are in direct proportion. <clears throat> direct proportions have many simple everyday applications, so many that often you don't even realize you are using them. So let's have a look at example here. We have two questions here. First, if x and y are directly proportional and x equals 5 when y equals 9, then what is y when x is 14? b, if a and b squared are directly proportional and a equals 5 when b equals 9, then what is a when b is 12? Okay, have a look at this question by yourself and uh, when you finish, please give me your answer in the chat box, okay? All right, let's have a look at the solution together. So for the first question, since x and y are directionally proportional, the ratio of x over y is constant, right? <coughs> so x over y is a constant number. We know when x equals 5, when y equals 9. So x over y equals 5 over 9, right? And <clears throat> when y becomes 14, we want this number, so let's call it x prime. Then x prime is 
5 pi 14 over 9, right? Which is <coughs> oh, sorry, my bad. You need to find the y when x is 14. So 14 is the, is the numerator, not the denominator. You need to find the new y, so let's call it y prime. Therefore, we know <coughs> the new y value becomes 14 by 9 over 5. So that's 126 over 5, right? <coughs> so y is 126 over 5 on x is 14 because x and y are directionally directly proportional okay b <coughs> we know a and b square are directly proportional so a over b square is the constant number right and we know that when a is 5 b is 9 or when b is 9 a is 5 that means a over b square should be 5 over 81 right and when b is 12 b square is 144 we want a new value of a let's call it a prime <coughs> then we know a prime equals 5 times 144 over 81 and that is 80 over 9 Any questions? No. Okay, then let's make a summary here. <coughs> In a summary, if x and y are directly proportional, then the quotient x over y is constant. In other words, x over y equals k, for some constant number k. <coughs> Another way to say this is to say that x is constant multiple of y or x equals ky for some non-zero constant k. The direct, <coughs> uh, direct proportion problems are essentially the same as the ratio problems we have already solved, right? Often a key step in solving direct proportion proportion problems is to find the constant ratio of the quantities involved. This constant ratio is sometimes called <coughs> ratio of proportionality. <coughs> or constant of proportionality. <clears throat> In the first part of the previous problem, this constant ratio of x to y is 5 over 9. Uh, In the second part of the constant ratio of a to b square is 5 over 81, right? <clears throat> okay, next let's see how we might use direct proportion to solve real-world problems. So we can start by using shadows to measure tall objects. For example, Mary is 5 feet tall and her shadow is 12 feet long. The flagpole she is standing next to casts a shadow that is 42 feet long. How long is the flagpole? Okay, I'll give you some time to solve this by yourself. When you finish, please give me your answer in the chat box, okay?
Let's have a look at the solution together. <clears throat> okay, because they are in direct proportion, so we could find the proportionality is constant first, right? The height of an object and the length of its shadow are directly proportional. So from Mary's height and her shadow, you can see that the height <coughs> of a object over a length of shadow is 5 over 2, right? <coughs> Turning to our flagpole, we know that the length of the shadow is 42 feet. So we have the height of <coughs> the flagpole. over the length of the shadow, which is 42 feet, equals 5 over 12 as well, right? Therefore, we have the <coughs> height of the flagpole is 5 over 12 times 42, which is 17.5 feet. <clears throat> Any questions? All right, if no questions, let's consider another real world problem. Dr. Tung must administer a emergency medicine to his patient, Mrs. Jones. Instructions on the medicine state that a 140 pound person must receive exactly 100 milliliters of the medicine and that patients of different weights should receive a proportional amount of the medicine. Mrs. Jones weighs only 120 pounds. How many milliliters of the medicine should Dr. Tu administer to Mrs. Jones? Again, when you finish, please give me your answer in the chat box, okay?
All right, let's have a look at the solution together. <coughs> so we know the weight of the patient and the amount of medicine required are directional, uh, directly proportional, right? So we have the weight of patient over the <coughs> milliliters of the medicine equals 140 over 100, which equals 7 over 5. Okay, note that the unit of this patient is pound. So if we let x be the amount required, For Mrs. Jones, again the unit is uh, milliliters. Then we have 120 over x equals 7 over 5, right? Then we can solve x equals 600 over 7, and the unit is milliliters. And again, if the question does not ask you to round up or down, you should keep it as the exact solution here. Or you could also write 85 plus 5 over 7 milliliters. <coughs> okay, any questions? Alright, if no questions, next let's have a look at another concept which is called inverse proportion. Just as two variable quantities are direct, directly proportional when their quotient is constant, two variable quantities are called inversely proportional when their product is constant. We also sometimes say that such quantities are in inverse proportion. For example, let's consider it's questions here. If P and Q are inversely proportional and P equals 7 when Q is 24, then find P when Q is 12. <coughs> well, because they are inversely proportional, so the product of these two numbers is a constant, right? So we know P times Q is a constant, and when P is 7, Q is 24. This means this constant number is 1, 6, 8, right? Therefore, when Q becomes 12, we can find new P, right? In this equation, we have new value of P, which is P prime here, is 1, 68 over 12, which is 1, 4, 14, right? <clears throat> In the second question, it tells us w square and z cube are inversely proportional. And again, if they are inversely proportional, we know the product of these two numbers must be constant, right? And when w equals 3, z equals 12. So this constant is 3 cube z, uh, sorry, uh, 3 square, 12 cube. And when w becomes 6, so that's 6 squared, we need to find the new z, right? So let's call it z prime. Then we can solve z prime is actually 3 squared times 12 cubed over 6 squared, right? <coughs> and that number is 4, 3, 2. Oh, sorry. I made a mistake here. This should not be z prime, but z prime cube, right? Because w squared and z cube are inversely proportional, not z prime. So we know z prime cube equals 432, and of course z prime equals 
the cubic root of this number here, which is uh, 6 cubic root of 2, right? <coughs> have a look at of this question here. Let me know if you have any questions, okay? All right, if you don't have any questions, let's make a summary here. <clears throat> if x and y are universally proportional, then the product xy is constant. We can write this as xy equals k, where k is a constant number, sometimes called constant of proportionality. The inverse proportion does not pop up in real life quite as often as direct proportion, but it has its moments. So let's have a look at some real world problems here that involves inverse <coughs> inversely proportional. <coughs> Sorry. So consider this question here. Twelve people together can clear a field in eighteen hours. In how many hours could nine people have cleared the same field? Well assume that all people clear field at the same rate. Again, when you finish, please give me your answer in the chat box, okay?
<coughs> All right, let's have a look at the solution together. First, we need to determine how the numbers, <coughs> how the number of workers and the amount of time needed are uh, related, because 12 people can clear the field in 18 hours. <coughs> 12 people clear 1 18th of the field each hour, right? <coughs> and therefore, each of the 12 people can clear 1 over 18 over 12 each hour, right? So if we have x people the x people together will clear x times <coughs> 1 over 18 over 12 which is 1 over 216 of the field each hour, right? <coughs> so in y hours for x people They can clear x times 1 over 2, 16 times y of the field, which is uh, x, y over 2, 1, 6, right? <coughs> so in order for them to clear the whole field, this expression must equal 1. So we have x, y over 2, 1, 6 equals 1. Therefore, we have x, y equals 2, 1, 6, right? Therefore, as you can see here, x and y are in <coughs> inversely proportional. So here, x equals 9, because we have 9 people here. If x equals 9, then y equals 2, 1, 6 over x, which is 2, 1, 6 over 9. And that is 24. The unit is hours, right? So when there are x equals 9 people, the job will take y equals 24 hours. You get it? <coughs> OK, if no questions, let's consider another example. Can you prove that if positive numbers x and y are inversely proportional and y and z are inversely proportional, then x and z must be in direct <coughs> directly proportional? <coughs> okay, have a look at this question by yourself first, and then we'll have a look at the solution together, okay?
Alright, let's have a look at the solution together. <coughs> because x and y are inversely proportional, we have the product of x, y equals a constant number a, right? And y and z are inversely proportional, we have y times z equals a constant number b. Of course, a and b can be any real numbers, but a is not zero and b is not zero, right? <coughs> We wish to see how x and, and z are related. We can solve the first equation for y and substitute the result in the second equation. But it's also faster to simplify the y x y equals a by y z equals b, right? So this <coughs> can help us to eliminate y. Therefore, we can use for the first equation divided by the second equation. This gives us x over z equals a over b, right? So as you can see here, a and b are constants. Of course, a over b is also a constant number. Since the ratio x over z equals a constant, the variables x and z are directly proportional. Okay, any questions? <coughs> Alright, good. If no questions, let's have a look at another concept which is called joint proportion. Direct proportion and inverse proportion involve relationships between two variable quantities and sometimes you have situations in which more than two varying quantities are related. So let's use this example as introduction of the joint proportion. So the idea Gauss law relates the pressure P, temperature T, and volume V of an ideal gas. The law states that PV equals N times RT, where R is the universal gas constant, and lowercase n is a measure of the number of molecules of a gas present. As its name suggests, R is a constant. For the following questions, assume that n remains constant. 
<coughs> A. If the temperature of ideal gas remains constant, how are pressure and volume of gas related? B. If the volume of an ideal gas remains constant, how are the pressure and temperature of the gas related? C. Most people are familiar with Celsius or Fahrenheit units for temperature or both. Why can we not express temperature in these units when using the ideal gas law? Last, suppose the volume of a gas is tripled and the pressure halved. How does the temperature change? <coughs> okay, have a look at the solution, uh, the question by yourself, and then we'll have a look at the solution together, okay? All right, now let's have a look at the solution together. The first question, if T and NR are constant, then the equation PV equals NRT tells us that PV is a constant, right? <coughs> Therefore, the pressure and volume of an ideal gas are inversely proportional if N and T are held constant. <coughs> Second, to consider the effect of holding V constant and letting P and T vary. We can rearrange PV equals NRT to place all the constant terms on one side and the varying terms on the other. Dividing by VT gives us <coughs> P over T equals N times R over V, right? Since N, R, and V are all constants, n r over v is also a constant. Therefore, the ratio of p over t is constant. So the pressure and temperature of an ideal gas are directly proportional when n and v are held constant, right? <coughs> okay, numbers, uh, question C. The reason we don't use Celsius or Fahrenheit as a unit of T here, is that Celsius and Fahrenheit both allow temperature of zero, and they allow negative temperatures. What would this do to the ideal gas law? R is constant, and pressure, volume, and number of molecules can't be negative, right? So we can't measure temperature in a scale that allows negative temperatures. We must use a absolute measure of temperature, which is called the Kelvin scale. <coughs> Kelvin scale is one such temperature scale that does not allow negative temperatures. Temperatures in degrees Kelvin are approximately 
273.15 degrees higher than the temperatures expressed in Celsius. So that we have 0 degrees Celsius is about 273.15 Kelvin. <clears throat> the temperature 0K is called absolute zero, which is a theoretical lower limit for temperature. So basically, you won't find anything that below 0K. That's why you must use Kelvin scale in the ideal gas law. <clears throat> Okay, next, as with the first two parts, we organize our work by putting the varying quantities on one side and the constant on the other. So we have PV over T equals NR. <coughs> we know that PV over T is constant. Let our original pressure, volume, and temperature be P1, V1, and T1. And let the new values of P, V, and T, B, P, 2, V, 2, and T, 2. Then we have P, 1, V, 1 over T, 1 must equal P, 2, V, 2, and T, 2, right? <coughs> Since P, V over T must be a constant. Since the volume is tripled and pressure halved, we have V, 2 equals 3, V, 1, and P, 2 equals P, 1 over 2. Therefore, we have <coughs> P1, V1 over T1 equals P1 over 2 times 3, V1 over T2, right? And of course, this can solve T2 equals 2 over 3, T1. So the temperature is multiplied by 3 over 2, or you can say it's increased by 50%. Did you get it? Also note that once again the temperature must be expressed in Kelvin, Kelvin scale, not Celsius, not Fahrenheit, but in Kelvin, okay? <coughs> Alright, so just as we show the temperature and pressure directly, <coughs> proportional, <coughs> all right. When all else is constant, we can also show that temperature and volume are directly proportional when all else is constant. We say that temperature is therefore jointly proportional to pressure and volume. So in a summary, we say a variable x is jointly proportional to a group of other variables if x is directly proportional to each of these variables in turn as all other variables are held constant. For example, if x is jointly proportional to y and z, we can write x equals k, y, z for some constant k. We can also write this relationship as x over y, z equals k. Did you get it? This is a concept of jointly proportional. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, if no questions, let's consider a real-world example. Some word problems are essentially joint proportion problem in disguise. So let's consider this question here. If you finish, you can give me your answer in the chat box, okay? And after that, we'll have a look at the solution together.
<clears throat> okay. All right. Some of you have already finished. So let's have a look at the solution together. <clears throat> so, the amount of wood is usually directly proportional to both the number of wood chucks and the, uh, the amount of time needed, right? So basically, you have the amount of wood over the <clears throat> number of wood chucks times the amount of time used should equal k, right? Assuming each wood chuck is identical. So basically, <coughs> this is their <coughs> rate, right? This is the uh, amount of wood they can chuck per one wood chuck per unit time. So that should be a constant number k. So we are given that if there are eight pieces of wood, we need five wood chucks in two hours to finish the work. <coughs> and what we don't know is if we have one wood chuck that works for 24 hours. The amount of pieces of wood is x. We don't know this number here, right? So in this method, we can calculate x is actually 8 times 24 over 10. So that'll give us 19.2 pieces of wood, right? <coughs> Did you get it? Okay, if you don't have any questions, let's consider another example. So one day Dale drove 100 miles at a constant rate. How far would he be? Would he have traveled if he had doubled his speed and tripled the length of time he drove? <coughs> also note that usually if an object travels at a constant rate r for a time t, then it travels a distant d. The relationship between the three quantities is d equals r times t, right? Or sometimes we could also use v to denote the speed. <coughs> okay, so th because this is a very simple question, let's uh, have a look at the solution together. For example, if Dale drives r miles per hour for t hours, he travels the distance of d equals rt, right, according to the formula. So if Dale, <coughs> if Dale doubles his rate, he doubles the distance he travels to 200 miles. If he then triples the time he drove, then the distance becomes 2r times 
three T, right? <coughs> or <coughs> then that becomes six R T, right? Which is six hundred miles. <coughs> you get it? Let's have a look at several rate problems. So have a look at of this question first. And if you finish, please give me an answer in the chat box, okay? <coughs> Often rate problems involve rates of travel but they can also be rates of performing any memorable task. Have a look at the solution together. Okay, he, she usually drives 45 miles per hour. Well, let's use MPH to denote the speed in 40 minutes, right? We have both minutes and hours amount or units. We therefore convert the minutes to hours. So 40 minutes is just uh, 40 over 60 in hour, right? Which is two over three hours. <coughs> so she drives 40 mi 45 miles per hour for two thirds hours. This gives us the distance. which is 30 miles. Now she has only 30 minutes or one over two, one half hour. To cover this 30 miles, her speed or rate must be total number of distance, 30 miles, over the time, which is one over two hour, right? Therefore, the speed she needs or the rate she needs is 60 mile miles per hour 60 mph right any questions <clears throat> it asks you to find the speed okay if no questions let's consider another one so how about this one? Again, when you finish, please give me your answer in the chat box and then we can have a look at the solution together.
Okay, let's have a look at the solution together. <coughs> so we have two numbers. We want the average speed, right? Do not you just use <coughs> the average of these two numbers, okay? Usually if you want to find the average speed, you need to use the total distance you drive <coughs> divided by the total time taken, right? This will give us the average speed during this round trip. <coughs> so the distance between the home to work is not changed, right? So let use a distance let's use a letter x to denote the distance between <coughs> home to work so then the total distance is just uh, 2x right what you need is a total time taken so the average speed equals total distance is just 2x <coughs> for the first leg we have okay you need to specify a unit here uh, unit is miles let's use miles here because it says 30 miles per hour the speed is in miles per hour so let's use miles as a unit of distance and from home to work, the first lag cost him x over 30 hours, right? And from work to home, it takes him x over 45. And this is our average speed. Apparently, you can cancel x here, right? So we have 2 over 1, 30 plus 1, 45. Simplify that will give us 36 miles per hour, which is average speed, right? <coughs> so as you can see here, it's not necessarily the average of these two speeds here. Did you get it? Let's consider another question. Again, when you finish, please give me an answer in the chat box. And after that, we'll have a look at the solution together, okay?
All right, let's have a look at the solution together. So here we <coughs> will be using a concept called the uh, rate of work multiplied by the time worked equals the amount of work done, right? <coughs> So if <coughs> PBM works alone, <coughs> she needs eight hours to finish the work. If Sam works alone, she need she, uh, she needs twelve hours to finish the work, right? So the work rate of Sam is one over twelve. Right, and work rate of Pippin <coughs> is one over eight, which means for one hour he can finish one eighth of the whole work. Right, and if they work together, the work rate is simply the sum of these two numbers, which is five over twenty-four. Right. So on one day, Sam works alone for two hours from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. So she worked 1 over 12 times two hours. Basically, she completes one sixth of the work, right? Plus the remaining work. For the remaining work, the do it together so the combined work rate is 1 over 12 plus 1 over 8 times the time needed this equals 1 because it completes the work right so basically one equation one unknown variable you can solve h is actually 4 right oh sorry usually we'll use time use letter t to denote the time taken Therefore, it requires four hours from 3 p.m. Therefore, when they finish, the time should be 7 p.m. Right? Any questions? Okay, if you don't have any questions, let's call it end for today. And I'll give you the homework for this lesson later on, okay? I'll see you next time then. Bye.